Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, taking time to, uh, to join us. My name's Simon Chilcott. I head up the manufacturing resources team here at ANS. Uh, just to set your expectations, you'll no doubt be relieved to hear this isn't going to be a sales pitch. There's a little bit about how ANS could help you, but our intention today is simply to inform and hopefully stimulate conversation within your own organisations. Uh, whether it's going to be a fun pack 50 or 60 minutes, I'll leave up to your imaginations, but I certainly hope you'll leave here better for the experience with some inspiration on how to convince your leadership team, if they haven't already been convinced, uh, that they really need to take this ever-growing threat seriously. Uh, the session is going to be kind of split into to two parts, really. Um, the first part will be really around presentations and content, focusing primarily on the global cybersecurity market, and then really sort of taking it and honing it into the manufacturing energy sector, which have obviously we feel have got some really sort of um, common themes, particularly when you start to look at operational technology and indeed IoT. The second part of them will capture some first-hand experience from one of ANS's customers. Uh, we're going to really aim there to delve into some of the lessons learned when looking to implement any kind of new uh, cybersecurity strategy. Uh, and then we'll have some sort of pre-prepared questions for our panel. So I've got a load of questions. Uh, if you don't want to hear those dull questions that I've come up with, uh, we'd really appreciate any that you have. They're probably going to be more relevant to your individual situations and obviously we'll encourage you to put them in your chat as you think of them. So without further ado, let's uh, introduce our panel. So um, let's meet them all. Uh, obviously, the whole what we really wanted to do today was to give you, a, I suppose, a, a view of all sides um, of this major problem. Um, you're obviously going to have ANS's side, so from a, a managed service provider. Um, you're going to have the view from a vendor, um, Ben from, from Fortinet, and then a view from the customer side. So kicking us off today, we're going to have Mark Johnson from ANS. He leads our cybersecurity practice, and he'll be giving you a very much a high-level view on what the current state of the global cybersecurity landscape is. So say hi, Mark, if you could wave. Beautiful waving, excellent. Uh, then I'm going to be joined by Ben White, who is a business development manager uh, for typically round operational technology and IoT at Fortinet. Uh, he's going to be talking with me around some of the specific reasons why the means of production and industry in general are under attack right now. So um, say hi, Ben. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and then last but by no means least, uh, we have Nadine Shafi, for, who's IT director at one of ANS's favourite customers, Callison, who are a leading owner and manager of, of uh, essential energy and infrastructure assets. Is that about right, Nadine? It certainly is. Hi, Simon. And hi, everyone. Um, now, we're going to be talking about how he's enhanced the security posture at, at Callison and how he gives his sort of user community enough flexibility to do their day jobs uh, without compromising security. So hopefully it'll be a great session. Really looking forward to getting into it. So uh, let's kick off. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, um, look forward to doing this uh, this session with, with Ben and Nadim as well. Uh, I'll just move on to the next slide. Yeah, so I'm Mark Johnson. I'm the practice lead for cybersecurity and connectivity at ANS. I've been at ANS for 10 years. But I have been in industry for about 35 years, uh, starting off in the armed forces in 1987, working on the, on the, in the Royal Signals on the uh, secure mobile networking um, for, um, for a, a system called Tarmigan. So I was one of the main uh, techni uh, technical architects for that. Uh, I'm working all the way through into service providers and then into, into ANS where we've, I've built the, the cybersecurity and connectivity practice. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about the, the cyber landscape. So this is more from a general point of view, but what we're seeing as a partner uh, working with our vendors such as Fortinet, uh, Microsoft, Cisco. So we're working with all these guys uh, to understand what that cyber landscape looks like. A little bit about us. You know, we, we've got a, a very mature SOC. Uh, SOC's been in operation plus 10 years. Uh, based in Manchester, every security cleared. Uh, over 300 customers uh, in from SMB through to enterprise customers and then over 25 plus years in delivering multi-vendor security solutions. We're very much about being 
security uh, focus for multi-disciplines. And what we mean by that is we provide security by default and by design and by deployment. And that is all within uh, those architectures. You can see them practices, so DevOps, AI, business apps, cloud infrastructure and data. And then some of our accreditations from a, from a micro, Microsoft perspective on the right hand side include ISO. Uh, and then obviously our main partnerships with the likes of Fortinet down at the bottom, which shows that we've got a, a pedigree of, of experience and maturity in this in this space. Uh, and I'll move on to the later parts of the uh, of the presentation now. So what is Jive and Change? So ANS is a, a, a digital transformation business. We, we are modernizing a lot of businesses at the moment. So security is one of those things that is that needs to be taken extremely seriously as we start to have that paradigm shift into, into everything that's cloud and digital. But a little bit about the where the cyber uh, criminal economy sits. So it's the third largest globally. From a GDP perspective, it comes third after China, the USA, and then the uh, cyber criminal economy is, is, is third. And that's got a market of $6 trillion. So it shows that these is very well organized. It's not some teenage spotty teenager sat in his bedroom in a hoodie trying to compromise uh, businesses. It's actually extremely well organized. And what I've got here is an, an excerpt from the Microsoft Digital De Defense Report uh, from 2022, which just shows you how well organized it is. So if you look at the bottom of the three circles, that is where you've got access brokers, trawling network, uh, trawling the, 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 the internet, looking at uh, organizations and looking for people with weak you know, hygiene practices or vulnerabilities, uh, maturity, uh, posture. And what these access brokers do is they sell that, that information or that, uh, that knowledge into affiliates, same as a kind of a franchise that will go out and start to compromise business and start to use programs such as Lockbit. Lockbit turned over last year post $10 billion based in the US. So as you can see, that's one of the largest ransomware as a service programs. And of course they do everything from giving you the software you need to download and, and, and the, the encryption keys, but down to the payment from the actual customer itself using cryptocurrency. But as you can see there, really well, well, well structured, well organized, and these are things that we've got to protect against. But what we also see now is customers start to modernize, and especially if you're looking at manufacturing and, and resources, modernizing has been that long process. Unless you are a relatively new startup, trying to modernize is quite is quite challenging. And these are probably four of the themes that we're seeing. So as people start to move to cloud, you're now moving on to a shared platform, and you're looking at different tools, different services, different application requirements. Uh, you're using more DevOps, more, more, more modern agile processes. So to trying to manage those deployments from a cloud perspective, moving from traditional, has been quite a challenge. Also, doing this, we're finding that most of the businesses that we have been working have kind of been skipping security and obviously not looking at security in, in any kind of depth. I mean, it is the end-to-end the -end landscape is quite massive, but things like mobile IoT, are the areas that probably are being skipped and not being taken into consideration. And then as we start to modernize as well, you've got uh, services such as power platforms or looking at dynamics or any SaaS-based services. We've now got business units within, within organizations doing their own thing. So like a shadow app deployment, which is obviously moving, not using IT to be able to go and do that type of work. So using power platforms, I can create my own application to solve my own business problems with my, with my own business units, which means I've got to say, how do they take security into consideration when doing that? And of course, when we are modernizing, we're now moving to more uh, container-based environments, serverless within cloud. So using things like Kubernetes, again, legacy type tooling doesn't support that. So we need to make sure that we, we can modernize the right tooling to give us the right posture and protection in those environments. There is also, speaking to Gartner, and this is just not around security, but if you look even from a SASE perspective or SSC, the consolidation is very much about how do we create better integrations with products that sit within single vendors. In the old days, back to um, probably the late 90s, early 2000s, when the, the advice given was dual perimeter firewalls using two different vendors. Now, as uh, the perimeters kind of change more to identity than it is, although those those elements are still required in the IoT and OT world. 
it, it's changed quite significantly and identity sits across pretty much every single practice you want to look at so having a single vendor um, kind of strategy allows us to take advantage of that advanced integration for those those products also reducing costs we've got several customers now even in the manufacturing space that have an abundance of different security tools doing the same things so there is an opportunity to start to consolidate those and to reduce those costs but also the the thing around administration and how do i administer it when i'm looking at different portals i don't have the end-to-end -end visibility of certain attacks so this is what the advice coming from Gartner is coming about and, and we've now got even from a sassy perspective single vendor uh, recommendations as well so obviously fortnite have a full sassy proposition to be able to go to market with and that's just down to the recommendations coming from the likes of gartner and forrester so the the, the market analysts the support of modern application applic uh, uh, architectures i kind of mentioned that brief in uh, previously but this is where we start to get how do we actually use and as we modernize how do we start to get the right tooling that is probably going to be cloud native or cloud native enabled to be able to protect uh, to protect these kind of environments we find it extremely difficult and now obviously we've got the emergence of um of chat gbt or open ai or even ai for that matter so we know these are becoming extremely challenging for customers and as we start to look at things like iot and ot and start to bring these uh, those analytics into cloud because we want to start to do things looking at business outcomes how can we start making use of that data building proper business uh, intelligence analytics we need to make sure we can we can support and protect those environments but then again if we start to look at the the, the attack landscape let's look at ai and look at, let's look at the the, the 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 advanced tools that the attacker can start to use using things like chat gpt bar roberta these are all ai tools that attackers are now using and i don't have to have i don't have to come from a devops background i don't need to know how to code i can start to use those prompts to be able to give me what is a compromise in a certain environment and go away and get me some SVEs on on certain uh, platforms that I can start to look at building compromise into and sell those into those access brokers or into those affiliates uh, or uh, franchises. But as you can start to see now, it's becoming extremely easy for people to build these campaigns into whatever industry we want. And this could be highly prevalent in the likes of manufacturing, uh, utilities, um food and drink all these are, are have got uh well-known compromises that can be basically retrieved from using ai tools such as uh, chat gpt also when we start to build and modernize our platforms from a digital perspective the attacker now has different vectors that they can start to attack to so if i use a model where I, well, i'm going to start to use machine learning which obviously is ai is a form of I can start to look at poisoning de training data that will go into a machine learning model, which will actually affect the algorithms and the processes, which obviously will affect the outputs. I can then start to get the training data and get some interference with that and start to retrieve that data to start to make so to maybe sell that on the dark web. Even if I start to look at an invasion attack within the algorithms and process to affect outputs, I can start to do that as well. But also, even if I can't penetrate those particular those particular processes, I can start to look at the output and then start to start um, if i've got something that's ip and it's uh, and it's very niche i can start looking how do i actually nick that uh, steal that model and then sell that again on the dark web or into those uh, into those affiliates so quite quickly you can start to understand that there's loads of vectors we need to start to think about when we start to modernize and start to digitize and using the things like ai which we know are very much in the forefront now and obviously staying at you know at the head of that curve is massively important from an operational and security and obviously obviously we're doing all that with responsible ai but also there's benefits so we can start using tools ourselves so we want to make sure we can be more productive in creating these type of responses to attacks using the tools that are inherent within the the fortinet stack within the microsoft stack uh you know if you look at cisco they've all got these we're, we're building now more AI tools to be able to protect or give the benefits to the defender. And obviously that increases the efficiency of the workforce, which we know is is pretty uh, is pretty challenging at the moment with well, 3.5 million security specialists down uh, in providing that suitable resources to support the market. But obviously we want to make sure we can reduce those MTTRs, MTTAs, to make sure we can respond in time to reduce the, the kind of in, in, impact that a incident could have. 
<coughs> excuse me, but also we want to use the, the prompt to make it easy for people to be able to retrieve information about their environment. And then obviously look at how do we continually optimize the environment to take on new things that as GPT starts to improve and goes to four and five, or four is here now, but five next, how do we then integrate that into not only the platform, but also into our applications and start and using prompts to be able to do and protect those environments as well. Connectivity. One of the things we find with most of the customers that we are migrating on that journey is one thing they don't consider as they start to have a very highly distributed application landscape. You know, they may have applications in SaaS, IaaS, PaaS, on-premise. We need to make sure that our users, our, device, our, our devices, our things that need to consume services, do it in a secure manner. And um, things, because they're not just devices anymore, we've got to start thinking about identity. We've got to start thinking about how we drive policy internally. So how do we think, enable things such as secure web gateway? How do we look at scale? You know, we want to make sure that um, for that recently, well, I think not recently, it's probably 18 months back where they they um, they acquired a PAKE. Again, that's an SSE platform starting to make sure they can scale and provide those services securely for the users consuming applications or platforms that need to be protected in any any kind of sense. So this is where the market's going. SASE is a, is a gap in the term, but it is a mix between software defined one and uh, SSE, which is uh, Secure Services Edge. I mean, this is where we're seeing the dynamic change of how people consume securely services. So that's where the, that market's kind of going. We obviously, uh, I won't touch too much on this. We'll leave that to, to Ben and Sai as they go through their Q&A uh, and the questions that, that Simon's pulled together. But again, we have got environments in manufacturing that could be anything up to 80, 90 years old. How do we protect those environments as we need to start to get more analytics and start to be more productive in the way that we want to manage these environments? We've got to start thinking about how do we get that data out? How do we get it into probably into cloud so we can have that scale using the right tooling to be able to have the right outcomes? So having that that, that Purdue model or whatever model we need to start to define and get that, inf that kind of insight into vulnerability management, threat intelligence around the vendors. We're a member of Visa, 40 that's a member of Visa. So it's over 300, you know, um, ISVs, vendors, MSSPs that are working together to provide this intelligence to allow us to protect these environments for, for our customers, uh, which we know are highly complex. We, we know that we can't have any downtime, so we're making sure that we can update if they can be updated in, in some of the vulnerabilities, but making sure we manage in a way all the insights are there so we can manage those environments appropriately. Uh, driving relevancy and cost. So ingesting stuff into 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 seams and saw and and sock services can be can be quite expensive. Um, so what we need to do is we need to make sure we when we do business impact analysis, we are collecting the right information that we can start to build our proper use cases. And using AI tooling, using saw and seam to be able to to be able to build detection rules, playbooks. Uh, so automation to be able to protect our environments based on the most relevant and precious, critical uh, services that we've got running in our environments. And again, this is another Gartner model that we've used. And then I kind of touched about this before, you know, 4.7 million you know, service security resources grew in 2022 and we're still 3.5 million short. This is probably why if anybody said of, of Copilot or any AI, AI, AI tools from, from Fortinet, is that because of the resource shortage that we have got, AI is now becoming a fundamental part of how we manage that gap, but also the way that we interact with customers and vendors. That triad of, of, of support needs to be really, really robust and scalable and agile. And the reason for that is that we're there to protect the, the same things. So we need to make sure we are all working closely together in partnership and then growing that capability within customers where they've got the appetite to do that, to grow it or to shrink it, that should be agile enough. And that's why MDR, so Managed Defense uh, Detection and Response, which is a cloud-based service, is agile enough to be able to grow or contract as it sees fit. And the case we can't get away from cyber insurance. It's it's uh, probably a bane of most people on the call's life. You know, we know the threats. Uh, you've you've got you know, um, quadruple ways of of ransomware actually attacking using the RAS schemes that we mentioned at the start. You now, whether it's just encrypting your data and asking for payments, 
whether they actually are actually um, stealing the data and then publishing that data for, for cost and then threatening then to uh, uh, affect the availability of applications and services that you provide to your customers or into the internet or also harassing your your uh, supply chain again four ways of doing it and we the survey that was we picked up here is 83 percent of those c level respondents i don't think they're adequately supported from a cyber threat perspective and what we what we are seeing also is that cyber insurance is changing the way it evaluates customers looking at posture looking at maturity looking at hygiene activities to make sure they can look at how they can get the right mandate to support that environment so the better your posture, the better your maturity, the better your hygiene activities are, the less premiums you're likely to pay. And if that that market is trying to is starting to change quite dramatically. So you should recognise that if you if you go through these uh, these steps. And then what the boards need to know. So I think and Nadine will probably touch upon this uh, as a board member itself. Is is how do we get the security, uh, not the, the actual board leadership, to understand how we want to. To, to manage security or manage incidents or risk and obviously identifying what the business critical assets are what is the likelihood of that compromise and then what is that impact but also what is the cost to to remediate it's probably a high level simplistic way of uh, attracting funds from the board because they they need to have this in layman's terms now this has come from multiple um global C CISOs of recommendations to boards uh, and what, what i've done is extracted that out to find out just so they can know labor and anything that affects revenue, anything that affects profits of a business uh, is, is, is massively important to any board. But also, how do we use security to 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 build value, create that opportunity and and also drive profits and trust with our with our customers? Because uh, if we are safe pair hands to deal with, then there's no reason why that would not attract you know, additional business into some of the entities that you're working with. So I'd just like to thank you for, for listening to me there. I hope you, you found that a bit useful and what we're seeing in, 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 uh, from a global threat perspective. But I'll now have, add in, uh, well, I'll hand over now to, uh, to, to Simon and to Ben uh, to go through you know, why industrial production is under threat. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate that whistle-stop tour of uh, the global cybersecurity landscape. I'm sure we're all suitably uh, concerned um, but now I'm joined by Ben White from Fortinet who after a little bit from me sort of setting the scene with some hopefully interesting facts and figures um, we're going to walk through an exploration on why the industrial sector is under so much intense pressure right now uh, particularly from a security standpoint um, okay so uh, most tax industries last year it's obviously not a particularly well kept secret, but industrial production has been under attack for quite a while now. Um, looking back at last year, it's the second most targeted sector. And obviously, if you incorporate retail, transport, energy into the mix, food and drink, obviously, if you look at this from a supply chain perspective, that's quite a, a heavy mix that are all involved or potentially um, involved in, in that scenario. Um, again, when we look at the beginning of, of this year, the first quarter of this year, the story is very much the same, but with a, obviously manufacturing being seriously out on its own. Um, and even just, you know, speaking from experience of our own teams um, in this sector on day-to-day -day conversations with our, our prospects and customers, um, that really absolutely rings true. Um, I, I guess it's possibly, you know, in the past, um, manufacturers been left alone, um, hackers or, uh, bad actors have had a sort of bigger fish to fry, uh, whether it be large corporates or the financial sector. Uh, maybe they've just run out of targets, but manufacturing is absolutely primed right now for the unwanted attention, obviously, that this uh, can bring. Uh, indeed, 42% of manufacturers have been a victim of cybercrime in, in the last 12 months. So that's not far off one in two. Obviously, the, you know, this is going to vary enormously from, you know, whether it be, you know, a, a full on, data breach or from a, a ransomware attack or somebody opening something that they shouldn't have but if you if you just look at it from that perspective obviously you know the the industry the sector is absolutely under attack um just for your awareness i'm sure you probably already know this you've probably been um informed about this before but under gdpr 
A data breach can result in a fine of between two and four percent of your annual turnover, up to 17 million pounds, obviously, depending on how big your organization is or how much it turns over. Um, this is an average figure. I know there's probably lots of other figures out there. This is from IBM, but um, the average cost. Now, this is not just obviously a ransomware attack. This is data being exfiltrated. This is data being used by by a bad, bad actor having to report it to the, um, the ICO. And obviously from there, um, you know, potentially large fines. And obviously not just the fine itself, but it takes the impact obviously on, on team members that are having to deal with these breaches. Um, that's the, the average figure right now. Um, we're talking before around, you know, how many manufacturers have been, been attacked um, over the last year. It's a government statistic. There's a couple more coming up, so you know they're absolutely spot on. Um, but 65% of cyber attacks have actually created some sort of production stoppage. So that's not just you know production line stopping. Obviously, that's the means of production. So any raw materials, anything that you're using in your day to day as part of the manufacturing process, um, it stopped you from delivering or sending you know um the product out, out out of the door and obviously knock on effect whether it be fines from you your customers or simply just that reputational damage is 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 potentially huge um i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm gonna not blame but uh say thank you to ben for this because this is ben's stat from um a, a couple of weeks ago when we had a discussion around cyber security and or cyber incident response plans and um he was just asking me the question around, you know, how many people out there have got a DR plan? How many people have got a, a business continuity plan? And I bet if we asked at a straw poll right now, 90, 95 percent of you would probably have one of those in place. Um, you know, whether you test them on an annual basis is obviously between you and your uh, organisations and your conscience, etc. But the reality is, is that, you know, we are as a as a nation underprepared for what happens if, you know, what are you doing? What if planning? um and how is that actually um how is that actually sort of being being born to bear so more government statistics do's mean that these companies do have these in place don't means that these companies don't have these in place just to be clear as you're reading through this it's obviously a very very busy slide um and you'll think what people haven't got up-to-date malware protection i mean my mum's got up-to-date malware protection right and i hear about it on an annual basis when she needs to uh to renew her policy um but if you think about it this is this has been taking a thousand businesses across the uk small medium and large i suppose what i'm trying to bring up here really is around it's around supply chain i'm sure that 90 95 percent of you hopefully more have got you know policies in place uh to you know to apply security updates within 14 days or vpns for your staff to remote in monitoring for user activity i'm sure you've got those in place but what if your supply chain doesn't? What if they don't take security as, as seriously as you do? Obviously, again, we were talking about the knock-on impact, reputational damage from something you're not necessarily doing, but something potentially your supply chain is. You know, if you've got 30, 40, 50 people in your supply chain and you're the end producer, then obviously it can have a massive impact. So that's just some facts and Time. figures. Just a quick one before you move yeah. on to that. Looking at it from a different perspective, it'd be interesting to see the performance against those for the people who do. So if you look yeah. at a policy to apply a software security update within 14 days and you apply at the moment that we're in the middle of Amazon Prime, so you've got a lot of manufacturers yeah. who are trying to ship out um, stock to someone like one of their biggest um, supplier or biggest uh, customers, Amazon, yeah who are going to compromise for that 14 day policy to be able to get product out the door so wow. they don't take they don't take the line down to be able yeah. to get it out so That's it'd be really interesting to see the uh, statistic with regards to yes we've got these but how do we enforce them what's the kpi against enforcement of them we're 100 percent, or actually if we have to compromise this for yeah. operational performance or getting an order out we will compromise it yeah, we've bought it, but we're not going to use it this week because X, Y, Z. Yeah, no, yeah. that's a really good point. Wow, that's even more concerning. Uh, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, 
So what we were going to do is just to literally do a bit of a run through and examine, I suppose, in a bit more detail why we feel industrial production is, is kind of under constant threat right now. Um, you know, we're seeing manufacturers in the news being attacked sort of daily by automated attacks. And Mark was obviously touching upon, you know, people using AI and that automation is, is really um, is starting to make it so much easier for them. So we've kind of split it into 10 key areas, which we feel are obviously relevant to you know, to the manufacturing, um, resources, uh, energy, utility sectors. And we'll just we'll just let you roll through them. Um, I'll have a few words on, on on each and then Ben will jump in on a few of them just to sort of give some examples where, you know, he's had some experience within within Fortinet as to, to what's gone on. So um, so from a critical infrastructure perspective, obviously, it's a hugely attractive um, target for the hacking community. Uh, shutting down the means of production to an energy provider or a large manufacturer is obviously going to create big news. And there's typically three different reasons why someone's going to do uh, some sort of attack or create, you know, become a bad actor, for want of a better word. You know, it's money, typically motivated by money. Um, celebrity, you know, becoming big news within the hacking community. That's something they get very excited by. Or obviously, in the case of some sort of state-sponsored attack, particularly when you're looking at critical infrastructure, there's a political element to it. Um, and obviously, hitting an organisation that's responsible for critical infrastructure um, or is a major uh, global manufacturer obviously means you're hitting pay dirt for uh, these characters. Um, critical infrastructure also relies on old control systems. I mean, I was thinking 40, 50 years old, but, you know, uh, as 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 Mark was saying before, some of them are controls at 80 and 90, you know, not built for this sort of online world. But have you got any examples of sort of critical infrastructure that you've sort of seen? Yeah, so I've worked in a lot of critical infrastructure based not only in Fortinet, but when I've worked for Emerson and a system integrator called Capula. So these are desirable targets. And when you look at them as desirable targets, I think it's more luck than it is actual targeted attack in the past, that the yeah. the adversaries have actually just happened to get into these places, didn't realize what they got into, and then actually thought, wow, this is a big payday for me. Because when you think about the original instance of how people used to do malware, they used to send emails to us to try and lock our own individual PC. And yeah. they used to send those out and obviously the return on investment for them because they work exactly the same as businesses. They look for optimization. They look for return on investment for the effort that they put in for the reward that they get. And they started to see that critical infrastructure was a more valuable target. And actually, when they started to look at it, it's not that a secure environment. They don't patch. They've got legacy yeah. systems. There are ways into these systems through the supply chain. So all three of those points can all be brought together where you have critical industries. So you can look at, say, oil and gas. Oil and gas have platforms. They also have upstream and downstream. And those upstream and downstream aspects could be done by two different businesses, but they both are classed mm -hmm. as critical infrastructure. Those systems need to be continuously pumping or extracting, pumping, and then refining. At any yeah. point in time you take one of those systems down for an outage period to maybe do an upgrade, that is a cost to the business, a production cost. However, they will, as I mentioned earlier on, they will compromise the security aspect if they've not planned an outage. So if they get a notification of a critical vulnerability that's been identified mm -hmm. in Windows operating system, they will say, we can't apply that patch at the moment because we can't take the system down because it requires a reboot. And we yeah. haven't got the, we haven't not, it's not the complexity, but we haven't got the availability within the system to be able to take part of it down to apply the patch to allow then the system to run safely. So we'd have to take wow. the whole system down to apply a patch to then bring it back up. So you then see obviously the difficulties in keeping production going and yeah. the compromise then of obviously the security. But the other thing is they don't actually have defense in depth in, installed on these systems. Mm -hmm. So that risk is their main issue now of part of that system. Yeah. And they are compromising the whole of that supply chain for the basis that they need to keep operating and keep refining or keep extracting to be able to keep hitting their KPIs for the amount of barrels that they're taking out of the ground or the amount of um, barrels that they are processing at the refineries. And then the supply chain complexity you can look at, everything that your business uses is supply chain. 
so that OEMs for the control systems, it's the system integrators who come and do the maintenance, it's the package plant vendors who provide you proactive maintenance services who've got direct connections into your system, it's IoT sensor providers who are adding that now um, additional level of visibility on bearing temperatures or aspects around the process that you use that is cheaper to put IoT in than it is to wire it in and put it into the existing control system. And all this now is adding complexity and expanding the attack surface for our customers. And yeah. yes, we can come in and we can talk about all the, the horror stories and we can do the scare tactics, but the way in which I approach and work with customers, and I'm sure yourselves at ANS do that, is we're a partnership, we're not a commodity. You have to have a partnership now within that supply chain from certain types of suppliers to be able to help you with your cybersecurity, not just for the project today, but for the business as usual activities. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, as, as you were saying, then you were you sort of referring then to, to, to legacy systems. And that was one of the, the critical pieces that we certainly see within within critical infrastructure. And I think that obviously, you know, most manufacturers, you talked about Windows 95 PC, you know, most manufacturers have got some sort of that awkward app that no one likes to talk about, but it's kind of ring fenced and we do our do our best to ensure that that's the case. And, you know, obviously the problem is it was written, you know, 30 years ago by Bobbin Accounts that's so no longer there and can't do any patching. And the reality is, is that they are great at doing the job that they're created to carry out, but they're just not secure enough to sort of bring into the fold when looking to unlock some of that stuff around production data insights and um, those embedded control systems are, are absolutely critical and when you look at those legacy systems um and you split them into hardware and software the hardware aspects are your plc your io controllers um your devices they are designed to be 25 30 35 or more life expectancy because they're a hardware yeah. function when you look at the aspect that monitors and controls that and then allows an operator to look at the process from a control room mm -hmm. that SCADA that we call it the supervisory control yeah. and data acquisition or the hmis that they've got they're the bits that are on common software life cycles that you can't give the 30 35 year life expectancy for you have yeah. to be upgrading these systems every five or six or seven years and that's the bit then when you get the mixing of legacy and new technologies and that's the bit then where you then start to get this bit where you're trying to do your best with cybersecurity, but you're trying to integrate it through that mixing of legacy no abs absolutely absolutely and obviously you know legacy is a, is, is a problem it's a good, good segue to obviously supply chain and obviously legacy systems that you know, you don't know, you might have 30, 40, 50 suppliers in, in your supply chain, you're the end producer, you have no idea what's actually going on. And I know, obviously, yeah. you know, we can ensure that, you know, we, we go through a, a tender process and everyone's got to have certain, you know, parameters in place to ensure that they, you know, we can trade and that we, but the reality is, is that, you know, there's going to be some that slip through, there's going to be some situations where, you know, there aren't those controls in place. And, and obviously, um, you know, whether it be people getting access to, to your network because they're meant to be have trusted access privileges and because that's part of your supply chain you know the reality is is that anything like that could potentially hold up production affect your reputational vicarious due to something that someone's doing within that supply chain so you know the reputational damage could be huge um moving on to remote operations um and we've talked obviously around um industrial control systems and obviously that they control physical processes that are around us, particularly when looking at energy and utilities. Um, I suppose the issue really is that they can be in very remote and external locations, which are obviously difficult to secure properly, um, you know, whether it's, you know, water treatment plants or sluice gates. Um, it's obviously critical that they're secured and a lot of them will have outdated sensors or systems designed years ago, possibly weren't even um, designed for, for, you know, being able to live in an online world um it's very difficult to to retroactively secure them um and even if the plan isn't to place what's out in the field at least being able to call out what that risk is quantify it qualify it and be able to to call out to key stakeholders ensures that you can you can move on and you know, understand what the potential risk is um well, well 
Sorry, if you combine though. if you combine four and five, so take remote yeah. operations, okay, to take a remote reservoir, okay. So yeah. every so we all we've all got the Peak District on our doorsteps around mm-hmm. this area. So I'm in Newcastle under Lyme, you're in Manchester. We've all yeah. got access to different parts of the Peak District. United Utilities will have reservoirs and everyone will go to that reservoir and walk around it. So yeah. their regulatory compliance there is health and safety. So they put up signs telling us not to go into the reservoir because of things like blue and green algae and yeah. so on and so on. So they're doing an aspect of physical security. However, the regulatory compliance there when you look in the remote operations, the cybersecurity aspect for that remote operation is, as you said, they'll use things like sluice gates. They'll use things like mm-hmm. pumps remotely. They'll start those without any visibility of who is in that environment and around that environment. If you get yeah. a compromise and somebody doesn't know what network they're on and what buttons they're pressing or what signals they're sending or how they're compromising, that mm-hmm. regulatory compliance is it there at this moment in time for those asset owners to now be securing the asset from a cyber intrusion as well as a physical intrusion. So the Health and Safety at Work Act in CDM regs tell us that we have to not only protect our workers, but we have to protect the general public in the environment Mm -hmm. that we are changing or we own. And therefore, that general public will have to be protected from a cyber intrusion as well, even though there's no direct link between health and safety and cyber. But some of these remote operators will fall under NIS. NIS requires them as a critical asset owner to be able to maintain that critical service they're providing, which means that when they start to look at it, they're working from data center first because they're focused on protecting data, i.e. GDPR. But when you talked about it earlier on and you showed the figures around GDPR, Say, for instance, a utility sector provider, they are not only on probably um, exposed to GDPR, they're Mm -hmm. also exposed to the fines under NIS if they have a cybersecurity issue. And if both are compromised, so you get an IT and an OT compromise, you'll find that the business has just got exposed to two sets of fines. But also then if you start to look at the environmental impacts, maybe they um, mm-hmm. maybe they discharge or maybe they cause a human impact and environmental impact, the associated reputational damage and cost. So you wow. can then see why they become high value targets, because yeah. actually it's quite it, it then puts them in a ver- in a predicament. It's cheaper to pay the ransom fine, the ransomware mm-hmm. cost than it is to expose ourselves, it is to put the remediation in, but then do you trust the person that you're paying to not come back and exploit you for the same vulnerability that you had? Yeah. So they all can tie into each other if you just take one particular person. They're all very interesting topics that you can talk about for hours. No, absolutely. absolutely. And I was gonna gonna say, we're we're in the interest of time, I think we might need to, uh... We'll, we'll we'll skip on we'll skip on yeah. to the next one um and then and then finish really so um obviously you know we talked about data integrity but certainly geographical um geographical distribution i think was one of the uh the areas that we were talking about before around you know remote offices sites um obviously if we're looking on a on a global um footing obviously uh geographical boundaries can be challenging and obviously each will re- require each country will require uh, you know a different kind of approach um it makes it much harder to to implement policies that are consistent uh ge- you know when you, when you're looking from a global perspective and obviously just increasing that attack um surface can can make targeting you know um easier routes of entry whether it be through networks or physical servers or server estates that are in rem- remote locations it's a similar kind of situation and again that goes into I think around in, interconnectivity as well when we're looking around using iot and sensors it just increases you know the proliferation of iot devices in, in you know globally um I've, most of them are created with cost efficiency in mind uh, certainly yep. from a sensor perspective they're not looking at really at security um you know they might lack sort of strong authentication encryption stuff like that if you if you take that interconnectivity aspect and you think of it as direct and indirect attacks. So I was talking to a customer the other day who um, a very, um, uh, well, a very regulated industry and they've implemented um, as a trial, a, um, a data diode to be able to send data out of the OT environment into a cloud infrastructure using IOT for sensors, because it is a more 
cost-effective solution to put the sensors into that environment to pull data out than it is to try and make a change in that environment, especially when they're looking at the decommissioning of these assets. And we got onto the subject then of that data that's coming out is giving a new view of information they never really had. The existing information that they had was coming from a control system and a safety system. And both of those are telling what they've always had. What happens, even though they're not directly connected, how does IoT now through the compromise? And I think Mark was talking about this earlier on about altering the way um, data is being used in AI and making changes so that it compromises the output and the way we change things. If you look at that, IoT, IIoT is not directly connected onto that network, that existing network, but indirectly through its actions and through the data and that cloud platform that it's in, if it's being compromised and it's showing something different, the operator now is stuck in between a rock and a hard place. He is being told by a control system that he is trusted with the information he's had for the last 10, 15, 20 years, the system's running safe. He's mm -hmm. now being told by a new solution that's been implemented with new signals or new feedback that he's never had, the system's running unsafe. Right. What does he do? So yeah. although it, it, it's got this ITOT convergence, but it's not necessarily sat on the OT network, it does have that indirect impact onto the OT operator in the OT network by causing that confusion aspect. So both of them have to be treated for cybersecurity. Both of them have to be looked at and how the user, which was one of the bits, uh, one of the points earlier on around the people aspect, I think it mm. was the human factor. We've got yeah. to factor that in as well. So that's why you need to look at people, process and technology. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Ben. No problems. Really, really illuminating. Um, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, right, uh, we in the interest of time, let's let's move on to Nadim. How are you doing? Welcome good, to the virtual you, stage. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so Nadim and I are going to start to talk about how he's taken on the challenge of enhancing the security landscape uh, that he discovered when he joined Kellison, um, and obviously ensuring that cybersecurity is now front of mind and taken seriously by the business um nadim it'd be really good to start off with just with, i suppose with an understanding of how you first started to attack the problem um and callison and, and what you sort of i suppose what you discovered upon upon joining really if i uh well, that's thanks Simon. so up for you. yeah that's great that's that's perfect so what we did first of all is we needed to understand the problem um so we had a number of different sort of areas so we sort of put them into basic pillars if you like so for start from the top left we had a number of different azure tenancies um, and between them we had things like weak two-factor authenticated uh, authentication we didn't have the right things like protection on devices which we kind of touched on earlier in the presentation today so we needed to tackle that area we also had a number of audit actions. So we, we've, we've referenced the company there that did our audit. So they did a number of audits on our organization and they brought up a number of things that we need to address. So we knew that was an area we need to tackle. Um, we actually had a cyber incident. So if we move on to cyber attacks, there's nothing like actually getting some real life, um, let's say exposure to actually um, drum up some attention. So thankfully it wasn't too um, severe but that certainly raises awareness so we, we know we have to deal with that we have incidents yeah. we have to deal with that and and you've mentioned their employee awareness which is also a factor we haven't done as, um, as much training as we'd like to in that space and then finally we were working with ans again not a plug to you simon so don't worry um <laughs> because we had to do a number of uh, cloud migrations and consolidations so we had uh, quite a lot of on-premise servers um and we had to go through a process where we were migrating them to Azure and deprecating data centers, et cetera. So that gave us quite a lot of challenges in terms of making sure we manage that project while still keeping an eye on security. And Ben will be pleased to know we are using Fortinet as well. So there you go, another plug for you there. So there was a lot of um, a lot of things going on. So first thing was we had to get that problem statement understood. And that's where that background sort of slide is really helpful. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, Nadine. And I suppose, obviously, um, like any, when you get to any kind of situation where you are looking, you've, you've come in and you thought, right, there's, there's some stuff I need to do here, for want of a better word. Obviously, then that, that leads you into sort of putting together or pulling together a plan, a strategy, 
um, some kind of roadmap that you sort of, I suppose, that you intend to to follow over the, the next few years. It'd be really good if you could just take us through what your kind of what your thoughts were at that time, and then obviously into what your sort of what your plan is moving forward. That would be that would be awesome. Brilliant. Yeah. So, first of all, what, what I like to do when I sort of tackle these situations is to put together a strategy and a roadmap because I think it's really important for everyone to see what you're trying to get to and how you're going to get there at a high level because ultimately you've got to present these things at, at a board level and you've got to make sure people understand what you're trying to do. So we as a team, we, we went through a brainstorming exercise of what we're trying to get to, what's our North Star, et cetera. And then we put together a roadmap of how we're going to get there in simple terms. And some of the key steps here we've we just illustrated on the slide. So the first thing is well, we needed to get in a um, some kind of proof of concept or incident or something to help um, almost illustrate the fact that we do have issues that people probably aren't aware of. So we've got to highlight the, the, the fact that we we are not some kind of organisation that is immune to attack. We are having things going on and we need to illustrate that to everyone. So, so that was the first thing we did was get something in there to kind of illustrate that. The second thing is we want to put together a plan to attain things like Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, so we do have um, ISO 27001 accreditation and then there's a number of steps you have to do to, to do that. But actually we wanted to add to that and then do more in terms of our environment. So that meant we had to look at things like the the ncsc's cyber essentials um, and the cyber assessment framework and there's a number of steps you have to do to do that so we looked at the best practices um we've got some of our um, additional tenancies and uh, that we wanted to add into our SOC. again we've got a SOC with a and so i think that's really important for everyone on the call that you know, unless you've got a team who are monitoring your estate 24-7, you're really going to struggle in terms of making sure you've got that identity and, and, and sort of protection of all the relevant assets that you've got. So having the SOC on board was really important to us. And then we wanted to integrate one of our tenancies into that SOC. So, so we made sure we did that. Um, and then not sure where the slide's gone, but don't worry, I'll carry on talking. Um, and then what we did is we, we put together uh, an awareness program uh, around education of users. So what we, we as we talked about earlier on, we, we were really keen to make sure that the weak point wasn't our users, which usually is the case. So we put together an education program around cybersecurity uh, and some of the stuff actually Mark's highlighted today is really useful actually in, in that space. And then finally, uh, and which is always important from a, from an ISO point of view, is we're working with a, a different third party to do things like pen testing, which often gets sort of overlooked. But you know, you annually have to test different elements of your organisation to identify areas you need to improve on. So it's part of that continual improvement cycle, really. So, so that's what we did at a high level. Um, and let's see the slides have come back on now. So we put that roadmap together. And the key thing was for me, I'm conscious of time, is that we were looking at metrics such as the Microsoft Secure Score to see how we were getting on um, on that roadmap. And, and I'm pleased to say we, we've made significant progress since since the start of the year. Um, and, and I'm not going to steal funder because that's something that we'll do at the end of the year. But but it's it's been a really good journey and we've made significant progress. So I'm really, really pleased with that. That's awesome today. Unfortunately, I didn't hear probably about a minute or a minute and a half of that because it would appear that uh, OpenReach have actually managed to sabotage the, the last five minutes of this uh, session. So I've now tethered. Um, so um, I'm assuming that was absolutely fantastic. And thank you very much, much for that. It'd be awesome if you could just give us a bit, I suppose, a bit of an understanding of how you've used employee training and awareness and kind of um, got to a point whereby you can um i suppose uh get to a point whereby you can take their i suppose not take the um take the lead but obviously yeah take the lead from a security perspective and, and really sort of ensure that they are doing what they need to do i think it's really important to highlight um how users can interact with with systems and cause security incidents so Clicking on a link may seem harmless, but if you actually illustrate what the impact of that is, for example, and how everyone's responsible for that, it's, it's not just a technology function. You know, you can protect as much as you like, but ultimately users have to be part of that protection. So I think it's really important that we need to make sure everyone's aware of that. Absolutely. No, to totally agree. Listen, thank you so much for that, Nadine. Really appreciate it. Apologies, it seems to have gone to, to a point whereby we've absolutely run out of time. Um, 
I suppose I just wanted to 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 close the session just by just by giving I suppose giving you an understand a quick quick two minutes. Um, these are the I suppose these are the the ways that we help to engage with our customers. We have navigators, we have accelerators, and obviously the service that that Mark was referring to briefly before was around um, around our managed detection and response um, service. So you can engage with us in, in whichever way you want as part of the, uh, I suppose, as part of the, as part of the excitement of, of being here today. Can you see that, Mark? Or am I just moving between various different slides now? You can't see anything at all. You see me? We, we can see you, we can only see the first slide. So that's the first slide in the deck. So right, we need well, to I'll get just, to... I'll just talk through it. So at the end of the day, the, the idea is that obviously being here today, we've got a complimentary workshop. We can give you a high level review of your cybersecurity and governance and, and effectively give you a, give you an understanding of what your potential governance strategy could look like, a high level adoption roadmap, um, and then a, a business case for change if you do need to do so. So really appreciate you being here today. Obviously, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with us. Um, and we're going to close the session there. Thank you very much indeed for attending.